We are often advised to wait at least 48 to 72 hours before we can train a muscle again. And if we train the muscle too soon, we will blunt hypertrophy because it hasn't fully recovered. In this video, we will cover if these general guidelines are really true, and if not, how long should we wait before training a muscle again? This idea is based on the premise of the general adaptation syndrome. As a brief overview, this cycle describes the recovery and adaptation process which occurs after resistance training. Essentially, when we train a muscle with enough intent, it causes a disruption to homeostasis. This then causes damage and inflammation of the muscle cells, resulting in a temporary reduction in function. However, after a few days, the body repairs the system and supercompensates as an adaptation to this stress, meaning the muscle gets bigger and stronger than it was before. Then we can train the muscle again and continue growing over time. So what we want to know is how long do we need to wait between these two points in time? And do we really need to let the muscle fully recover and adapt before it gets trained again? Furthermore, is this general adaptation syndrome model even applicable when it comes to muscle growth? I think the best place to start with this topic is by looking at the research on frequency. This refers to how many times per week a muscle is trained, assuming total weekly volume is equated. What we tend to find is that higher frequencies seem to be slightly superior for muscle growth compared with training a muscle only once per week. And this trend even continues with very high frequency training. For example, this study explored the effects of training each muscle 3 versus 6 times per week. Half the subjects performed 4 sets for each exercise across 3 sessions per week, while the other half performed only 2 sets for each exercise across 6 sessions per week. So the exercises and total weekly volume were exactly the same between groups. As we can see, the high frequency group trained each muscle on consecutive days for 6 days in a row. For example, the chest is trained with some sort of fly variation each day from Monday to Saturday. After six weeks, both groups saw similar muscle growth for all muscles measured, apart from the biceps which achieved no muscle growth in the high frequency group for some reason. This may simply be a random finding or a statistical error since it goes against the rest of the data. So ignoring this one finding, this study shows that even training a muscle on back-to-back -back days, six days in a row, still produced great muscle growth. And this idea was taken even further in this study, which explored the effects of training the same muscle twice per day. Trainees all performed the same exercises on the same days with the same volumes and rep ranges. However, one group performed all the sets in a single session, while the other group performed half the sets in the morning and half the sets in the afternoon. As we can see, the same exercises were performed in the morning and the afternoon, meaning each muscle was trained after only a few hours of recovery. After 8 weeks of training, there were no noticeable differences in muscle growth between groups. So based on this evidence, there doesn't really seem to be a detrimental effect on muscle growth when training a muscle within short time frames. This may be because the high frequency training groups performed less volume per session, since total weekly volume was equated in these studies. So in the high frequency conditions, each muscle may have experienced less disruption, meaning their recovery times were shorter. Whereas training a muscle less frequently means that more volume must be performed per session, probably requiring longer recovery times. So the recovery times may be shorter or longer, depending on how much volume the muscle is trained with within each session. Let's now explore recovery times in a little more detail. Recovery is a very vague term that is multifactorial and specific to each adaptation. So let's break down recovery into a few different categories and cover each component individually. First, let's explore how long it takes for lifting performance to recover. Once we perform a resistance training session, we see a decrease in lifting performance since we fatigue and damage the muscles. So how long does it take before our lifting performance returns to baseline? This was explored in this study, which looked at the time it takes to recover lifting performance after a hypertrophy style training session. Trainees performed three sets of 10 squats and bench press to failure. Before the training and for multiple days after, trainees performed sub-maximal squat and bench press reps at 75% 1RM, where bar velocity was recorded, which is an indicator of strength that doesn't induce much fatigue. And as we can see, for both the bench press and squats, trainees saw an immediate decrease in lifting velocity after the training session. Although by the 48 hour mark, lifting performance had pretty much returned back to baseline for both lifts. Although it should be noted that the exact training sessions performed can have a major influence on strength recovery. 
Generally, training closer to failure with more volume using compound exercises, which train the muscle at long lengths, are probably going to increase recovery times. Whereas training further from failure with less volume using isolation exercises, which train the muscle at shorter lengths, can probably recover performance much faster. Another metric used to assess recovery for hypertrophy training is muscle protein synthesis. This is supposedly an indicator of muscle tissue repair and synthesis, but isn't a direct measure of muscle growth itself. This research review aimed to establish how muscle protein synthesis changes after a resistance training session. The authors established this graph showing how muscle protein synthesis rates change after a resistance training session. For trained lifters, muscle protein synthesis rates returned almost back to baseline within around 10 hours post-training, but then took up to 36 hours to reduce from there, as shown in the blue. Whereas for untrained lifters, synthesis rates stayed elevated for longer than 48 hours post-training, shown in the orange. It is difficult to extrapolate practical recommendations from this data, but there are a few points that may help us with the topic of this video. Firstly, for trained lifters, MPS seems to peak only a few hours post-training and returns almost back to baseline within 24 hours for the most part. This suggests the recovery cycle for muscle growth may actually be shorter than what is traditionally reported. And secondly, those who are new to lifting probably need longer muscle recovery times compared with trained lifters. And this makes sense since resistance training is a new stimulus for them, so this is likely to disrupt homeostasis to a greater extent. Another marker that we can use to assess the time course of recovery is muscle soreness. Muscle soreness is generally thought of as an indicator of muscle damage. Although soreness is not directly correlated with muscle growth, it is usually used as a general measure of muscle recovery. This study explored the time course of muscle soreness after resistance training. Subjects who had not trained in the last six months performed five sets of six reps to failure of inclined dumbbell curls. They performed this same training session twice, with each session separated by seven days. After the first session, bicep soreness peaked at 48 hours post-training and didn't come back to baseline levels even after four days post-training, shown in the blue. However, after the second session, trainees barely experienced much soreness at all, shown in the orange. This study suggests that the time course of muscle recovery could be more than four days after a muscle is trained, or as little as 24 hours, depending on your familiarization of the training protocol. So once again, it is hard to extrapolate these findings into practical recommendations, because muscle soreness isn't really a direct measure of muscle growth. Another question regarding muscle soreness is, should we wait until the muscle is completely pain-free, or is it okay to train while we are still sore? Well, there is no exact answer to this, but here are my general recommendations. I think that you probably don't want to train a muscle if it is very sore, as it will probably just inhibit lifting quality, and the muscle may need time to physiologically recover to the training stress. However, I think that training with slight soreness is not really an issue, as long as it is not inhibiting your workout. Furthermore, if you do experience significant soreness in a muscle, I think that a good general rule is that you can train that muscle against once you have passed the peak of your soreness. As we alluded to, our familiarization of the training protocol has a big influence on recovery times. Most studies will use quite a tough training protocol because their goal is to induce significant disruption so they can study what happens in the recovery period. Furthermore, these studies may use untrained subjects, or even if they are trained, it is not the same training methods they are accustomed to. For these reasons, the magnitude and duration of disruption and recovery are probably exacerbated compared with what a regular lifter would experience. Most of the time, we perform a similar training routine each week, and when we change our training, it is probably only a small tweak of one or two different variables. Because of this, we are likely to recover a little faster than what is experienced in these studies as the body acclimates to the training stress over time. So overall, based on these indicators of recovery, it seems as though it could take anywhere between around one to five days for a muscle to recover from resistance training. The exact recovery duration is dependent on the difficulty of the training protocol and how familiar or novel the exercise protocol is. A muscle will likely need longer to recover when performing more volume and training closer to failure, and when the trainee is unaccustomed to the exercise. And a muscle will likely need shorter recovery times when performing less volume and training further from failure, and when the trainee is accustomed to the exercise.
Another factor influencing how long trainees should wait before training a muscle again is regional muscle stress. This refers to which specific regions of a muscle or muscle group are more and less stressed. So even if a muscle is trained one day, not all portions may be maximally stressed. This means it may not need as much recovery time before being trained again. For example, horizontal rows and vertical pulls both train the back muscles, but they tend to bias different regions. Horizontal rows tend to bias the upper and middle traps and rhomboids, while vertical pulls tend to bias the lats and lower traps. If we were to perform pull-ups to train the lats, they may need two to three days to fully recover before they can be trained again. However, the upper back muscles may not be maximally stressed and can be trained again after only 24 hours. So the next day, it may be okay to perform a horizontal row variation like a seated cable row. So based on this information, let's establish some practical recommendations. Well, there are mixed findings in the research which make it difficult to provide concrete recommendations. When looking at actual muscle growth, which is the strongest form of evidence we have, it seems that there isn't much difference between how long we allow a muscle to recover when total weekly volume is equated. Muscle growth doesn't seem to be compromised when training a muscle on back-to-back -back days, even for multiple days in a row. However, this may be because when training with a high frequency like this, less volume is performed in each session, so recovery times may be shorter. Furthermore, when we pair this with other indirect markers of recovery, such as lifting performance, soreness, and muscle protein synthesis rates, there seems to be at least some window of recovery needed for the body to adapt. Although the exact time frames for muscle recovery seem to be influenced by the difficulty of the training session and the familiarity of the training method. As a starting point, trainees should probably leave at least around 48 hours before training a muscle again. However, trainees can adjust this recovery duration based on biofeedback such as lifting performance, perceived fatigue, and muscle soreness. If you aren't feeling much muscle soreness, fatigue, or decreases in lifting performance, then I think there is no issue with training a muscle on consecutive days if you want to. However, if you hit the muscle with high volume and intensity, and it was a novel exercise, then you may need to wait three to four days before training that muscle again. And lastly, we should also note that you may be able to train a muscle again before it is fully recovered by stressing certain portions with different exercises. You may have stressed one region of a muscle group, but not different regions. This means you can technically hit the same muscle group within short timeframes without overlapping recovery issues. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.